We're going to have a bit of very bright nostalgia this morning because Simon Fraser University has turned to the general public and the labor movement to raise a million dollars for the J.S. Woodsworth Endowment Fund to the Humanities. If you don't know who J.S. Woodsworth was, you should be ashamed of yourself. I am honored to have in the studio this morning two of Canada's most distinguished politicians, both socialists. And one of them is Grace McInnes, who is the daughter of J.S. Woodsworth. Grace will admit to nudging 80. She was 13 years in the provincial legislature and in the House of Commons. And with her is the estimable Harold Winch, on whom I cut my teeth as a young reporter in the legislature in Victoria in the 40s. Harold Winch was 20 years in the provincial government, 12 as leader of the opposition, 19 years in the Federal House of Commons, and both he and Grace have left very solid marks on the social development in this country. So we're going to chat up uh, their knowledge of J.S. Woodsworth and themselves on the program this morning. Uh, good morning, Grace McInnes. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Harold Winch. Good morning, Jack. Uh, I was so delighted when I saw the release from Simon Fraser, my alma mater, if you please, that they've turned to the general public and the labor movement to help raise a million dollars for the J.S. Woodsworth Endowment Fund of the Humanities. And in case you missed the introduction to the program, Grace is the daughter of uh, the aforesaid J.S. Woodsworth and served nine years in the Federal House and four years in the Provincial Legislature. Right. Were you there in the days of the great uh, triumvirate of the three women? Yes, indeed. Who were the three women? Uh, Gretchen Steves, Laura Jameson, and myself. Right. And Harold Winch, of course, was 19 years in the Federal House. Yes. 20 years in the Provincial House. That's correct. Who was elected the same day as you when you were first elected to office? My father. Ernie Winch. That's right. What year was that? 1933, November the 2nd. How many years were you leader of the opposition? Uh, Twelve years. In Victoria? Yes, that's right. Twelve years in Victoria. Now, matter of fact, now, I always remember the drama in 52, when it was touch and go, touch and go, whether you or W.A.C. Bennett would be called to form the government after the defeat of the coalition liberals, right? That's right. How close was that? Because that would have changed the face and the future of British Columbia had the NDP been given the opportunity to govern in 52? Well, by our rights, we should have formed the government if we had been under the old system of the straight X ballot. But the coalition knew it was going to break up, so it brought in the transferable ballot, where you voted one, two, three, four, and down the line. On the first choice of the electorate of British Columbia in 1952, we were ahead. But you had to have one plus 50 percent and not too many members get elected on the one plus 50 percent. So they had to go to the second, third, and fourth choices. With the result that it ended up with 18 for the Socrates and 17 for ourselves. Now, there was one independent labor, Tom Uphill. I went to Tom Uphill and I said, declare yourself. If you declare yourself, we have 18, and as we have been the official opposition, and as we are an old party since 1933, they'll have to call on us to form the government. And Tom Uphill said, I'm going to stay in the middle where I have a say no matter which one goes in. I'm not going to declare. Therefore, the lieutenant governor had to say, social credit have 18, you have 17, I must call on Mr. Bennett. That's what happened. Uphill's conscience must have tortured him at some time or another after that. <laughs> oh, Tom Uphill always took that kind of a position because he said, I have to be in the position of being able to come out in support of the government yes. upon occasion because I need the road work for my constituency. Uh, excuse me diverting from the topic this Go morning, ahead. but I always wanted to get that specifically from mm -hmm. Harold. Mm -hmm. Now, who was J.S. Woodsworth, Grace McInnes? Well, J.S. Woodsworth uh, was a, a humanitarian from the word go. He, he, he progressed through life from uh, trying to realize his ideals. And when one agency or uh, organization 
uh, uh, didn't serve his purposes as well, he moved to another one. But he was your father. He was my father. He was born when? He was born in uh, 1874 in Etobicoke, Ontario. I think we'll just roll that little clip, which is from the SFU prepared material, just to give people an idea of who Woodsworth really was. J.S. Woodsworth, socialist, parliamentarian, humanist. Woodsworth fought for much of what we take for granted today. Family allowances, unemployment insurance, old age pensions. Woodsworth was the first leader of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. His development of the landmark Bill 5 guaranteed every public sector employee's right to belong to a union. What year was the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation actually formed? 1933, although there was a preliminary meeting in Calgary in 1932. And Woodsworth, tell me what you know and remember of Woodsworth, Harold Winch. Oh, I can remember a great deal about Mr. Woodsworth because back in 1918, after the Reverend Woodsworth had left the church, he came to Vancouver in search of some kind of employment so as to maintain his family. And in his searches, he landed up at the hiring hall of the Longshoremen's Union. My father was the business agent at that time of the Longshoremen's Union and president of the Trades and Labor Council. He was able to give him the odd job, but not much, because uh, it had to go first to the union men. So Dad invited J.S. to stay in our home at 1218 Howe Street. Now, in 1918, that was the year of the worldwide flu epidemic. And there was a very popular man in the union who went down with the flu. And there were so many ill, you couldn't get a nurse or anybody to stay with this man. So the union said, we've got to do something, because they loved him so much. So my dad said to J.S., will you go and sit with this colleague of ours and do what you can for him? And J.S. did, sat with him until he died. The union offered to pay him, and he refused. He was doing his humanitarian job. And so the union, in order to thank him, initiated him as a member of the union and that is how J.S. became a longshoreman on the Vancouver waterfront. Does Dr. Grace remember that story? Uh, no, this is the first time I've heard it from Harold, but I still have the longshore button, his uh, membership in the uh, trade union. Hey, you, you were, where were you born? I was born in Winnipeg. And that's where your father's principal base was. By uh, the way, I noticed the house burned down the other day. Yes, I know. It was very old and uh, structurally not very in very good shape. It wasn't any real loss, and it wasn't in a good location, really, to be made into a heritage place. Now, your father, was he virtually born a socialist, or had you come from no. other traditions? No, he came from the tradition of ministers, Methodist ministers and uh, uh, lay preachers and things like that. He got ready to be a minister himself, but in the process, he, his father sent him for a year to Oxford, and it was there that he uh, became much more critical of, of the whole uh, scriptural uh, field, and also that he got seized with the idea of building the kingdom of heaven on earth and not waiting for heaven uh, or the other world. And so when he came back, it wasn't too long before he uh, wanted to get into uh, other work and was put in charge of a mission where he learned all about immigration. He was one of the first people to uh, let, uh, welcome the immigrants from all over Europe, they were in those days, and to uh, uh, keep their traditions but weave them into the Canadian fabric in the mission. So you were brought up. You, did you know your father was a socialist then? It wasn't he a very wasn't popular. He wasn't a socialist. Uh, he didn't know anything about socialism as such, uh, uh, officially. We, he really became known as a socialist and knew himself as a socialist when he got onto the West Coast out there, uh, where they considered that he was a sky pilot and uh, the old-time socialist, a sky pilot and rather suspect, but a pretty good person all the same because of the... Uh, Harold's uh, story is a good illustration of why we'll get some more of the germination of the CCF, which later became the NDP. First, what to Harold Winch after the break. Wow. 
Harold Winch, you were going to give me some more of the germination of the socialist movement uh, through Woodsworth. He oh. was the prime mover at all times. Yes, but what I had in mind is very interesting, I think, in view of what Grace just said about uh, J.S. and socialism. When J.S. came to live with us at 1218 House Street, upstairs there were two front bedrooms. My brother Charlie, Alan, and myself had one bedroom, and J.S. had the next one. And I'm telling you that week after week, when my father would come home from trades and labor meetings or union meetings, he would bring up a pot of tea into J.S.'s room, and they would go at it. J.S. trying to convert my father to Christianity, my father trying to convert <laughs> J.S. to socialism, and they ended up by agreeing that they were both the same. <laughs> <laughs> Christianity and socialism. We're the both king, the same yep, in objective. Yep, yep. Right. The kingdom of heaven on earth today. Yes, right. but you see, it was finally after the various agencies that my father had been trying to work through that he came to the conclusion that uh, you couldn't do anything without tackling the business of government. And that was why he, he came last of all to the political thing. There was no politics in either, either side of our family. Well, J.S. died in 1942. That's right. As I recall. Socialism hadn't flourished that much at that time, had it? Oh, yeah. In Canada. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's big well, in no, Europe. No, BC it in, had. in British Columbia, there was quite a number of them. Uh, there, there, were seven were members. there were seven Socialist Party members almost at the turn of the century. Why would that be when it's never, it was never much in Ontario and nothing in the East? They were from Britain. A lot of them were British leaders, and they had the British Labour Party tradition. Not to only that, the BC was the last of the pioneering section That's right, of, Tarot Tarot. of Canada. And those who came to British Columbia were coal miners from England mm -hmm. and Scandinavian lumbermen. Mm -hmm. yep. And they were in the forefront of the labor movement and the socialist movement in Europe. So therefore, they brought that with them into BC. So BC gave the leadership in trade union movement and the socialist movement in Canada. But the real watershed came with the Winnipeg strike in 1919, because all of those strike leaders, without exception, except my father, I think, all of them came from the British Isles with, with well-founded uh, traditions, and they knew where they were going and what they wanted to do. They weren't foreigners. And many of them were arbitrarily deported, however, were they no, not? No, they weren't, because uh, they, they didn't deport any of the strike leaders, because uh, they didn't dare do it. Because, you see, uh, uh, although some of them were convicted and served jail terms, uh, when the uh, various elections came for the legislature, the city council, and Ottawa, the populace of Winnipeg voted those strike leaders into mm -hmm. the different jobs. So uh, your father, therefore, was the leader of the Winnipeg General Strike? No, he wasn't. He didn't know there was going to be a strike until he was heading east to be vetted to see whether he would like to take on a job in the Labour Church as a, as a pastor there. He learned about that the strike was on when he got as far by train as Edmonton, I think. When did you first know you were a socialist? Oh, I learned that in the, in the Winnipeg Strike because I saw what, what Winnipeg was, divided. Should we say socialist or social democrats? Because socialist in some socialist places... Socialist no, democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but socialist is good enough for anybody that understands. Yeah, but lots of people might not understand. I know, they muck up communism. If they had understood, we had been in the government a long time ago yeah, and stayed in. They well, think that communism and socialism are the same thing, and that's the trouble. When was J.S. elected to Parliament? 1921. 1921. And can he be truly given the, the direct credit for old age pensions, family allowances, and these other benefits? What he can be given is the credit for having a focus in there because he built up the farmers from Alberta and Agnes McPhail from Ontario and others into a little ginger group. And they were able to focus public opinion, and it was all the opinions, the uh, organizations throughout the country, bringing pressure through them uh, where there, there was a sounding board in Parliament that was responsible for getting old age pensions and, uh, and uh, these, these other things. Mm -hmm. see, you know, I'd, what is it used to say that the socialists were liberals in a hurry? Does that not still apply today? No. Liberals because socialism are never has in a, a hurry. definite objective yeah. of a cooperative order of society, That's whereas right. the liberals believe in the free enterprise competitive order of but society. But aren't both of you both distinguished, you're not pioneer socialists? Socialism was well established. Oh, yeah when you came up the pike. But aren't you kind of mystified by the fact that there isn't a 
that there never has been a real federal presence on the possibility of an NDP government in Ottawa. Aren't you shocked and dismayed by your Canadian brethren? It took 50 years for Britain, uh, for, the, for them in Britain to form a Labour Party after they started to form a Labour government. And it'll take years here, more so because we're such a, a differentiated population of all over Europe and the world now. It'll take time. Arnold, disappointed? Disappointed, but not frustrated. That's one thing that one must never be in a movement such as ours or an elected member. Never become frustrated because our case is so good, our analysis so good, that eventually, one by one, mm -hmm. whoever's in power has to and does adopt the proposals that we put forward. And although we'd like to be in the government to do it ourselves, not disappointed if the others do it. It's getting the job done that is the important thing, not having the power necessarily to do it yourself. This year we've got one seat in, in uh, Bill says, when people see through what we're talking about, uh, they come our way and but they you, stay. But you too would be the first to admit that because of the social allowances, the safety net, and despite the recession, the standard of living and the economy for the, the, the working man today is vastly improved from the impetus that the socialist movement got from the dirty 30s. Oh, no question about it. Eh? But n maybe for the working men, but there's an awful lot that are not working men and working families, and uh, that, that is going to be the big uh, business of what happens when, uh, to the safety net and that kind of thing now. Who gets the credit for Medicare? Was that Tommy Douglas Tommy or was that J.S. Yep. Woodward? Yep. Tommy Douglas. Tommy that Douglas. was Tommy Douglas. Yeah. J.S. gets it for uh, tricking Mackenzie King into signing a document promising old age pensions. The only thing that Mackenzie King ever signed on the dotted line and he had to come through. And, that and came my through. father should get the yeah. credit for the establishment of senior citizens housing exactly. in North America exactly. and also for the establishment of the Crease Clinic mm -hmm. so you can be mm -hmm. treated for mental illness instead of being committed as an insane person. Yeah. And for silicosis, Harold, you get that. Yeah, the fight for the, the dreaded minus lung disease. Yes. Now, yes. I'm glad to see the federal government has started this endowment with a $100,000 donation. You're going to raise a million, you're going to help to raise a million dollars for the J.S. Woodruff Endowment Fund in the Humanities at the University of British Columbia. I'm always frightened to take calls because there will be millions of them. But I, I, I can't resist it. Let's uh, do one segment of calls to Grace McInnes, J.S. Woodsworth's daughter, and Harold Winch, Ernie Winch's son, as for the old timers, after the break.